Good afternoon, everyone. I, I have the uh, pleasure and the privilege uh, this afternoon of welcoming uh, all of you and uh, particularly welcoming uh, the Christian Culture Series uh, to our site here at Our Lady of the Assumption Parish in Windsor. I'm the administrator of the parish, uh, Father Don McLeod. Uh, I'm also a member of the board of Assumption University, so I am uh, particularly happy to be able to uh, contribute uh, in whatever way possible to the uh, development and to the promotion uh, both of the Christian Culture Series and uh, of Assumption University. And uh, with that, again, I want to welcome you all here, and uh, I will ask Father Tom Rosica to introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, Father McLeod, my confrere and pastor, acting pastor here. Thank you very much for your hosting this second of our lecture series this year. As you know, the theme of this year is holiness and the call to holiness. And we're looking at the question, the topic of holiness, from many different angles. In our first lecture of the series, the end of 2014, we considered holiness, family life, and marriage. And if you remember, we talked about the recent extraordinary synod on the family and marriage. Today we're going to look at another angle of holiness from the perspective of wholeness, holiness and wholeness, salus, health, salvation, and how that comes together in the care of pastoral ministers and the care of Christian leaders. We are honored to have with us an eminent scholar and speaker in this area. Father James Flavin, ordained a priest of the Archdiocese of Boston in 1987, received graduate degrees from St. John's Seminary in Boston and Boston College. He did his postgraduate studies at Barry University in Miami Shores. For 20 years, he served in inner city parishes in the Archdiocese of Boston that was followed by five years as the Vicar of Clergy Office with Cardinal Sean O'Malley. When you ask brother priests of Father Flavin and many colleagues of his about him, this is what they say, and this comes exactly from many priests that I asked. They speak about Father Flavin, great administrative skills, a compassionate counselor, warm interpersonal manners, young, community organizer, excellent teacher, faces issues head on with boldness, courage, and fidelity. They also speak about him as a great unifier and one who has addressed the issues of sexual abuse in a rather remarkable way. And he works closely with one of the great leaders in that area, Cardinal Sean O'Malley. Father Flavin is a licensed mental health clinician who has served until recently as the president of the St. John Vianney Center, 50-bed psychiatric hospital in Philadelphia. He was responsible for in clinical programming, increased patient experience, improved care and health care for those who minister to God's people. He's helped diocesan and religious leadership across North America. He's cared for the caregivers. He developed multidisciplinary teams of psychological and medical human resources to address clients' needs. Most recently, he was appointed Episcopal Vicar for the Central Region for the Archdiocese of Boston. Cardinal O'Malley called him back home. He needed Father Flavin to help him in that huge American Catholic Diocese. He continues speaking engagements. He's known all over the world. He speaks on a variety of topics, including behavioral health, addictive disease, trauma, wellness, stress, and self-care. He's a priest and a licensed psychotherapist. He brings a well-rounded view of healthy living, holiness, through spirituality and psychology to clergy, religious, and lay leaders. We are honored to have Father Flavin in our midst today. It's a quick visit, but it's a blessing to have him. I give you Father James Flavin. My mother is the only one that says nicer things. That's very nice. I don't recognize myself. As Father Tom said, my last few years have been really blessed that I've been able to work specifically with clergy and religious around the world. 
addressing the major issues of sexual abuse, but importantly also looking at just general health, wholeness, and how do we encourage happy, healthy, holy priests and nuns around the world. I can say you are my 101st diocese that I have visited in the last few years. Um, and it's nice to be here with you to talk about these important things and important ways of living. I come to you really as a brother on the journey. I've spent much of my priesthood um, studying human behavior in the social sciences. You've probably heard it said that most of us who study psychology go into it to try to figure out our own problems. There's probably a lot of truth to that. But I'm a firm believer in the value of psychology and behavioral health in general, along with spirituality, at making us those happy, healthy, holy people that God has called us to be. We in psychology are better able to help people understand themselves. We can help people manage serious organic and chronic emotional difficulties. We can offer wonderful tools to help people manage stress and addictions. But we cannot help people find the ultimate meaning of life. Recently, this was brought home to me when a psychologist friend in Boston said, I need you to see one of my patients. He's asking me about God, and we didn't do that in class. There's a newfound need for spirituality in the psychological world, because psychology itself is not enough, nor does it answer the ultimate questions of life. Interesting, though, one of the most successful psychological problems in dealing with addictions is 12-step spirituality. I'm sure you've all heard of that in AA, NA, SA, those sorts of groups. But the interesting thing is it's all based on faith and on the teachings of the church. It's nothing new that we haven't been doing for 2,000 years since Jesus was with us. You know the 12-step spirituality, right? Let me just give you the first few steps. The first step says, I am powerless over many aspects of life. I am not in control of life. The second step is that God is greater than me, and God loves me. The third step is I need God's help. Now, isn't that an amazing psychological principle? It's all based on what we've known since Jesus was with us. It's Catholic to the core. And so spirituality and psychology and well-rounded life goes hand in hand. And a healthy psychological life only comes when I realize I really am powerless over many things. And if I try to control everything, it's going to fall apart. We found a wonderful new word today that we speak of often, stress. Have you got any? But you know, to be more healthy, we need to recognize first and foremost that we are not perfect. We strive for it, huh? But when is the day that you will be perfect? The day you're laying right here and what the priest is saying the prayers at your funeral. That's the day we enter hopefully into perfection of holiness with the Lord in the kingdom. Until then, we strive, but we are not perfect. I love what Pope Francis recently said. The church is made up of sinful men and women, sinful priests, sinful nuns, sinful bishops, sinful cardinals, a sinful pope. All of us are like this. However, he said, 
We sinners are called to let ourselves be transformed, renewed, and sanctified by God. My true credentials, in spite of all the wonderful things that Father Rosica said introducing me, my true credentials today to speak on this subject come from admitting that I have the same problem in life that St. Paul had. He spoke of it in the seventh chapter of his letter to the Romans. St. Paul said, I don't understand myself at all, for I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do the very things I hate. <laughs> I know perfectly well that what I am is doing is wrong, and my bad conscience shows that I agree that the law is good, but I can't help myself because it is sin inside me that makes me do evil things. I know I am rotten through and through, so far as my old sinful nature is concerned. No matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. When I want to do good, I don't. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyway. Do you recognize that problem that St. Paul had? Welcome to the human race. It's a struggle we all have. But knowing that, how do we develop ourselves as human beings born in the image and likeness of God? And how, as Catholic Christians, can I help others come to that same experience? I'd like to share with you what I believe is one of the greatest papal documents of our time, which addresses how we can form ourselves as healthy people with a healthy spirituality. In 1992, St. Pope John Paul II issued a document for seminary formation called Pastoris Dabo Vobis. Although he was addressing how seminaries could form well-rounded, happy, healthy, holy priests, it makes perfect sense for all of us in forming ourselves as Christians and as human beings. St. Pope John Paul II used four pillars that must be equally addressed for all human formation. So I would just like to share with you for a few moments the four pillars that the saint said we need to focus on to be well-rounded people. The first pillar he called the human pillar. The second he called spiritual the third intellectual, and the fourth pastoral. And if all of these components are looked at equally in life, we have half a chance of developing a healthy spirituality and becoming effectively mature people. Interesting for a pope to talk about human formation as a core foundation for this. This is the incarnational one. You know that one, I'm not an angel, Obviously, it would be easier if I were, because this body of mine gets in the way a lot. It's wrinkling, <laughs> the hairline's receding, the waistline is expanding. So I better learn to befriend this body, because you know what? I'm stuck with it until the day I'm laying here. And then there's that whole resurrection thing where it's coming back. I better to learn to love this now. You know, it's the love of truth of who I am. The ideas of loyalty, of respect for myself, of loving this self, 
a sense of justice for me and for others. It's about integrity, compassion, having balance in behavior and judgment. You know all those human things? It's really important to look at that, to focus on the pillar of human formation for all of us. As important as a spiritual life is, sometimes I have to push the tray of cookies away myself. When it's midnight and I'm hungry, tired, and lonely, and I can say, God, please, please don't let me eat these cookies. And God is good. God gave me the reason to say, push away from the table. So I have to do some of this work in this human formation. The second pillar that the Holy Father spoke of is what he calls the spiritual. This is the one the church has done pretty well with. The struggle, though, with spiritual formation is to develop a healthy spirituality strengthened by religion and not an empty religiosity without depth. What do I mean by that? Everything we do in spirituality is in the hopes of falling in love with Jesus Christ. We can all do pious practices, which are important, but if it doesn't change my interior life, if I'm not on fire for the Lord Jesus, if he is not my best friend, if God the Father is not supporting me and the Spirit is not strengthening me, then what's the point? This spirituality is at the core of what we call transcendence. It's what my psychologist friend said he wasn't comfortable with because he didn't have that class. It's part of the human condition that we all want to be part of something more. There's something else beyond. We as Catholic Christians know that that's God. You know, the Latin word for transcendence is climbing or going beyond. This began a long time ago. Even Aristotle talks about God as the prime mover. The Greek philosophers, the human condition from the beginning of time has asked, Am I part of something bigger? Is there something more? Is there transcendence to life? It's coming to hear and realize the words that we hear in the gospel on the feast of the baptism of the Lord. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. In you I am well pleased. That's pretty good self-image building, isn't it? But this is spirituality, not psychology. Boy, they do go hand in hand. It's our beliefs that guide us. It's our desire to become one with the Father, as Jesus did. The third pillar the Holy Father spoke of is what he calls the intellectual pillar that we need to exercise this. And we need to expand this throughout our lives. Rational thought is pretty good. And you know what my problem often is? Is that I have irrational thoughts. Do you have those? I'm never gonna get everything done. No one likes me. I'm different than all the rest. I shouldn't be getting older. You know those irrational thoughts. It's important to build our intellectual capacity to begin to rationalize more and more life. It's part of our culture. It's part of our heritage as Catholics. 
I'm here at Assumption University. They don't just teach spirituality, do they? The world is filled with Catholic universities, helping the rational person to grow. Our culture has been filled with those kinds of people. You know some of the names. Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, John Neumann, Catherine Drexel, Ignatius of Loyola. Our culture is based in rational thought. And as St. Pope John Paul II says, the pillar of intellectual stimulation is important for our growth in being a well-rounded person. The final pillar he spoke of, the fourth pillar, he calls pastoral. He says, pastoral charity is the virtue by which we imitate Christ in his self, giving and service. It is not just what we do, but our gift of self, which manifests Christ's love for his flock. Pastoral charity determines our way of thinking and acting, our way of relating to people. The pillar of pastoral development is important for all of us. Now, he was speaking of it in the context of developing healthy priests, but all of us are called to pastoral charity. You remember those pastoral charity things. We call them the corporal works of mercy. Feed the hungry. Give drink to the thirsty. Clothe the naked. Shelter the homeless. Visit the sick. Ransom the captive. Bury the dead. Those help us become who we are called to be as human beings, as well-developed individuals. Interesting, Pope Benedict and now Pope Francis are speaking of a fifth pillar. Now, it hasn't been formalized yet, but I think it's coming. They both speak of communion that we need to develop communion with one another because we're not here alone, are we? The church is filled with us today. The world is filled with us. We're not called to just have a relationship alone with Jesus Christ, but that relationship is supposed to expand out to our sisters and brothers. Am I my brother's keeper? Yep, <laughs> you are. And so that pillar will be coming more and more in the life of our church. So we need to get insight into this. In the midst of this all, Pope John Paul II says that what this does for us is helps us to grow in affective maturity. Now, if you read church documents on formation for priesthood or religious life, over and over, the church speaks of affective maturity being important. There's just one little catch to it. They didn't explain what it is. Now, I imagine affective maturity is different for a 20-year-old than a 50-year-old, right? I think we get the essence of it but we really haven't named it. I think I'm going to take a gamble at this. Because the church hasn't defined it, I'm going to try with four things that I think are important. First, I would say self-awareness. Second, an ability of self-regulation. Third, having social awareness. And fourth, having social skills. Now, if you look at Jesus Christ, he had those, and he had affective maturity because of those. What do I mean? Social awareness, look, I'm sorry, self-awareness. Look at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane after the Last Supper. We see him kneeling down on a rock praying, tears of blood. Father, please let this cup pass me by. I don't want it. 
He was very aware of his emotions. But Jesus had self-regulation. After that awful moment, he came to his senses, right? He said, all right, all right. I, I, I picture him crying, scared to death and saying, okay, okay. Father, you've been with me this whole time. Not my will, but yours be done. If he didn't have self-regulation, he would have been fighting them guards when they showed up. Jesus had affective maturity. He had social awareness. Do you remember when he went into the temple and he rolled open the scroll and read? And as he was reading that this is fulfilled in your hearing today, what was the reaction of the crowd? They were angry. Who do you think you are? And Jesus recognized that. And what did they want to do with him? Throw him over the cliff. Stone him. But Jesus had social skills. Imagine an angry mob wanting to kill you and being able to walk through the midst of them. I'm just taking a stab at this. But I think those four pieces are important for affective maturity, which change as we do throughout our lives. Hopefully we get better at it. But sometimes we slip. I think it's more spirally as opposed to linear. Well, if I can only get to this point, then I'll do this, then I'll get that point. Because I've often thought that I can't wait for my life to get together. Do you, do you know that moment? Like, when am I going to get it? I'm thought, when, I, when I was in high school, I thought, once I get to college, then I'll get it. Then after college, I have a good graduate school, then I'll get it. You, you know that, that system, right? Then you go out and you, you date someone and you say, well, when I get married, then I'll get it. Well, I have kids, then I'll get it. Well, then once the kids leave, then I'll get it. <laughs> once I retire, then I'll get it. I don't think we ever get it. We will be perfect the day we're laying here. Until then, we try our best. Does that resonate at all with you? These are important principles at helping us become affectively mature in our lives. These social skills are important. So self-awareness comes about when we engage with other folks. If we're able to kind of objectively look at ourselves and understand ourselves, and sometimes laugh at ourselves. It's one of the greatest, I would say, pitfalls is that when that scary stuff starts to happen and I really start to get aware of myself, I want to get away from it. You know that sense? I want to, I want to run from it. But then I never really get to know the self because I'm always avoiding the self. So I need healthy people around me to mirror who I am so that I can stay healthy. That self-awareness is so important. It's important to spend time alone. That's different than being lonely or isolated. huh? That self-regulation that sense of being able to regulate our emotions, as Jesus did, is important. It's, I keep going back to my chocolate chip cookies. I did this talk once in another place, and for weeks after, I got chocolate chip cookies delivered to my address by people who thought they were helping me. But you know, it's, it's the sense of if I'm lonely, tired, scared, any of those things, I try to soothe myself. And I'm not always good at regulating myself at midnight when I need to be soothed with those hot chocolate chip cookies and, the, and milk. And for me, 
I know when I've had enough chocolate chip cookies when the gallon of milk is gone. That's not a good way to regulate yourself, is it? <laughs> That's why they make these shirts with elastic. <laughs> but God has given me the ability to regulate myself. That's the wonderful gift. I have it. I made in the image and likeness of God. And I need to be socially aware also. Sometimes I hear people say, well, I don't care what other people think. Well, we should because we're in this together. Now, to a limit, huh? But we should. How do we get a sense of, of how we are coming across to people? My dad, God be good to him in heaven, had my mother, who always told him how he was coming across, You know, he'd come downstairs with the, his outfit on and say, what do you think of this? And she'd say, you're not going out of the house dressed like that. What will people think? So the poor man went through his life being told always how he was coming across socially. They had 50 wonderful years together. When he died, actually my mother always says, you don't talk about me in public, do you? So I hope this doesn't get on the piece, but... When my dad died, she was heartbroken. I mean, they were just one of those couples that were together their whole lives. They were all, at every event, they were just a together couple. And when he died, she said, I just want to die and be with your father. Now, I understood, I mean, 50 years together, I mean, that was her life. But I finally said to her, I said, Ma, give him a break. He's enjoying himself up there right now, wearing whatever he wants. So she's giving him a break, thank God. <laughs> this affect of maturity helps us with what we call in the psych world a locus of control. Ever heard that word, a locus of control? Is the world affecting me? or am I affecting the world, basically? What do I mean by that? Some folks, we say, have an internal locus of control. I'm in control more, and others have an external. Now, there are a lot of factors in goes into this, developing this, but it's an important part of affective maturity for pastoris d'albovobis. Stick with me. So, let's, let's look at two people. Johnny and Clara have a math test. They both go to school, take the math test. They both flunk. Johnny has an external locus of control. Johnny says, the teacher just doesn't like me. No one in that school likes me. I'm never going to get anywhere in life. He has an external locus of control. It's out there causing it all. Clara has the internal locus of control. She says, wow, I should have studied harder. I think I'll get a tutor, and next time I'll do better. Which is more healthy? Which is more effectively mature? Now, there are a lot of obstacles that get in the way of this. But I ask you just to think, how do we come to know ourselves and grow in holiness? And remember, holiness is the same as wholeness, wellness, the whole package, right? Spirituality and our relationship with God is the whole package of things. St. Augustine said, O oh God, ever the same, let me know myself. Let me know you. I'm throwing a lot of things at you today. But an interesting new piece of research. In the past, people would often think that emotional health can lead to success in work, relationships, and general health. And researchers believed that success made people happy. Right? 
I'm successful, therefore I'm happy. New research shows happiness leads to more successful people. Because the world is not coming at you to do things to you, but you and God are, are, are working together to find the goodness around. See how this psychology and spirituality stuff kind of fits together and blends so often? I could go on and on forever about all these sorts of things. But it's all about relationship. And I would ask you just to think through some of these questions about where you are in your life with affective maturity. It's questions like, can I share my authentic self with others? Do I like the person that I'm becoming? Can I maintain personal relationships? Can I deeply share myself with others? Am I comfortable being alone with myself? Am I comfortable being with others? How do I relate to people who are different than me? How comfortable am I with authority? What are the obstacles that get in the way of my growth with healthy intimacy and affective maturity? Am I comfortable with my own sexuality and do I seek to integrate it? When I use the word sexuality, I mean the whole package. Everything about how we love and relate to folks. That's our sexuality. The whole package. Am I respectful in the commitments I make in life? So, here we are knowing what we need to accomplish to develop as God has called us to develop. But as you can see, this stuff takes a lot of work. Huh? It's not easy. I wish it were. I wish I could just sit here in this church and it would all happen. And sometimes it's great and easier just to sit here in this church. But then I gotta go out that door. That's where the challenge begins. That's where we need to engage the culture. When I was asked to talk about this healthy wholeness, one of the, there, were, there were a few areas that were raised of things that are really almost epidemic today that are destroying the human condition. Now we can go through hundreds of things, but there are two things that we know are happening today that I see often in the psych world in practice. These two things, sexual abuse and the misuse of technology, they can arrest or retard our development for effective maturity or send us spiraling backward in our development in our, and in our recognizing that we are made in the image and likeness of God. The terrible scandal that many of our priests have perpetrated upon minors has given rise to the terrible epidemic of sexual abuse in general. Currently, the Church is developing a new commission in the Vatican, which includes survivors of those abused by priests, so that we can begin to raise worldwide awareness and to seek to alleviate the suffering that the abuse of minors causes. Today, the Catholic Church educates more people about the terrible crime of sexual abuse than any other institution on the face of the earth. However, we have a long way to go and we've done a lot of harm and hurt. Abuse by clergy is especially heinous because it destroys a person's relationship with God. All abuse of minors destroys a sense of self. I ask my folks in the US to look at the Canadian statistics since I was coming up here to talk to you 
of sexual abuse. I wanted to see, are you different than we are in the United States? And the interesting thing is, unfortunately, you're just about the same. It's the human condition. We know more in the developed countries about this because we keep records, because law enforcement keeps records. But I believe wholeheartedly that this is a worldwide epidemic. Some may say, why are you bringing this up? It was a problem from the past. It's the human condition. Hopefully we can raise awareness and help educate, but the human condition will never change. But hopefully the church can be at the forefront of raising awareness and educating people so that it happens less. Just to say, why should we talk about this in this talk? These are some Canadian statistics from your law enforcement. In 2009 in Canada, there were over 15,500 police reported victims of sexual offense age 15 years and older, and 92% of them were women. Speaking here on behalf of a university today, these, these statistics that I'm giving you are the same in the U.S. and the same in the other developed countries that we've been able to keep these records. It's estimated that between 15 and 25% of North American college and university aged women will experience some form of sexual assault during their academic career. Four out of five female undergrads surveyed at Canadian universities said that they had been victims of violence in a dating relationship. One in four North American women will be sexually assaulted during their lifetime. 60% of all of these are under the age of 17. Of every 100 incidents of sexual assault, it's believed that only six are reported to police. In 2011, Canadian law enforcement reported over 3,800 incidents of sexual violations against children. And 93% of sexual assault survivors do not report it to police. It's a bigger problem than the church. What we did is terrible, horrendous, awful. But we need to talk about this. It continues, more often in families. It continues. If one in four women Two in six boys are the numbers that we use who are abused. You know someone who has. How do we help people heal? Education is so important. Keeping the secrets are sick and hurtful. And I would encourage anyone who's watching this, if you've been a victim of sexual abuse, come forward. It's the beginning of the healing process. But keeping it secret, it just gets worse and spirals downhill. And it gets very difficult to know that you truly are made in the image and likeness of God. Do you think this affects affective maturity? We need to begin to speak to this terrible issue of our time. The other area that I was asked to speak about that I would say is epidemic today, especially in the developed world, is the misuse of internet. It's destroying careers, families, individual lives, and our ability to relate to one another and to God. Most of us over the age of 26 are considered digital immigrants. 
Those under the age 25 and under are digital natives. They grew up with those little devices. It's their way of communicating. But for thousands of years, human beings have been socialized through verbal and nonverbal communication. The gospel is a call to enter into a relationship with the one who loves me. Affective maturity is gained through communion with others. What will become of us if we limit our communication to texting and tweeting or the hundreds and hundreds of other technological innovations that do not allow human communion? We're struggling to address the many facets of technology because it's happening so quickly, huh? We're good now at treating alcohol addiction. The internet as we know it has been around maybe 10 years. We call it process addiction. And we're not even ready in the psych world to call it an addiction yet. It's happening so quickly. But the field's expanding every single day. But as fast as we are able to study one medium, a new one comes up. And you know what this looks like. It goes from gaming to gambling to shopping to anything you want. Wasted time, spending money, to pornography. The numbers of families that are being destroyed by this are overwhelming. We as church need to address this today. How are we going to educate a whole generation who is unable to talk to one another and communicate the way humans have always done? At Thanksgiving with my family, there were 20 something of us sitting there and the kids were at one end of the table and we were all talking and the kids were laughing without saying anything and we finally said, What's so funny down that end of the table? Well, they had been talking about us since we sat down, under the table, texting. It's going to make for some interesting thanksgivings for the next generation. But the use of, of internet is overwhelming because we don't necessarily understand it. We've done some pretty good studies now watching actual brain development change with internet use. Physical change on the brain chemistry. It's, it's really scary of what's happening with this and we haven't really addressed it yet because we don't understand it. The use of internet pornography is overwhelming out of control. It's being used mostly, this, this is a shocking number that, that a study recently said, between nine and noon Nine in the morning and noontime at work. I would have thought late at night. But it's becoming so overwhelming and addictive. It's alluring because it seems to be affordable, it seems to be accessible, it seems to be anonymous, and you can do it by yourself. None of those things are true. None of them. And people are getting themselves into major legal difficulties because of this. But we are not sure yet how to address it because it's so new and frightening. But the, the issues of internet pornography are out of control. And I'll give you a US statistic. Every second in the United States last year, $3,075.64 are spent on pornography on the internet. Frightening. Every second, 28,258 internet users are viewing pornography. Every second, 372 internet users Google adult search terms. Every 39 minutes, a new pornographic video is being created in the United States. This is an epidemic that's destroying the human soul. 
It's destroying families. It's equal to adultery in a relationship. We need to address this to make sure that we stay healthy. It's a spiritual loss in our lives. The problem with it is the role of shame, especially with pornography. Shame is an awful thing. Have you ever felt shamed on something? It's one of the worst feelings we have. It's when we've lost relationship with God and we don't believe we're lovable. And we don't believe anyone would love us. And the feeling is so overwhelming that my brain and our brain is wired to say, get away from the shame and remember the last time you felt good. It was when you were involved in the internet misuse. But you do it again and then the shame kicks in. And this cycle is now overwhelming people. We definitely need to work on this. Huh? These are two issues of many around the world. But they're two issues that are endemic to our culture that we as Catholic Christians can address. The only way to address it is to talk about it. There's a wonderful saying in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're as sick as your secrets. You're as sick as your secrets. This stuff is happening in our homes. Right? When you look at the numbers, it's not out in the West. It, it can't all be out there, huh? I mean, it, it, it's here. It's us. There's no them. That's coming back to communion in the church. That we together, with Christ's help, need to focus and address these issues to help us all become more healthy, happy, and holy people. I would ask as we finish up, to go back to the pillars of Pastoris Dabo Vobis in your own life. Whatever struggles we have as part of the human condition, working on those four pillars can help us grow, can help us be healthy. Looking at the human side, here's where I think psychology can be helpful. It's important to know the effects of some of the things that happened in our past. Now, you don't have to focus on it forever and stay there, right? The whole point is to move beyond. But it's still interesting to know, why do I do the things I don't want to do over and over, as St. Paul said? What is it about my past? What is it about the way I'm wired? Understanding can be very helpful in that. I would recommend everyone see a psychologist for a while in life. Now that's because I'm in the business. But I think it really helps to come to know ourselves. Having spiritual direction. Sitting with someone saying, where is God working in my life? Because God is working in every one of your lives today, at this very moment. But oftentimes, because of stressors in life, we are not present to the God who is present to us here and now. Do you want to be healthy in life? Wouldn't you like to have a happy, healthy, holy life? I can't promise you a rose garden. Life has its stress. The hairline is receding and the waist is expanding and some of that I can control but some of it is part of the human condition. Sickness, pain, suffering, that's life. But it's not the end of the story, because Jesus Christ is with us. Thank you so much for your time with us today. I hope these simple thoughts have helped you to come to know some simple ways of coming to terms with the fact that you are loved by God that you are made in the image and likeness of the one who created us. That changes everything. And life in the church certainly has the answers. Thank you very much for your time.
Father Flavin, on behalf of all of us here at Assumption University and a very wide television audience around the world, I want to thank you for a very enlightening and inspiring talk. The theme of this year's series is holiness. And today we heard about the qualifications for holiness. In order to be holy, we have to be human and we have to be whole. We spoke about the self-awareness, self-regulation, social awareness, and social skills. And each of us has encountered people who manifest those in remarkable ways. Today, our guest speaker modeled that for us. So on behalf of all of us at Assumption, thank you for coming all the way from Boston. Bring our best wishes back home to your wonderful Cardinal, who is another perfect example of wholeness and holiness. Thank you all for being here today at Assumption Church, the McEwen campus. And until next time, God bless you all. Thank you.